Good morning, Chapel family. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. Let's sing together. Christ is my reward in all of my devotion. When there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy, through every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here, to God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. All right, well, good morning again. Nick and I shot that back in March, and I'm glad we could finally finally use that it's just been sitting on my computer for months anyway uh, again once again uh, my name is Chase if I don't know you uh, if you snuck in uh, after uh, the welcome or you just turning it tuning in online with us um, I have the privilege of serving as lead pastor here in Nordonia and we are in the third week of our membership series uh, so if you have a Bible go ahead and open to the book of Acts Acts chapter 2 is where we're gonna be uh, we spent a long time in the book of Acts this winter and spring, and so hopefully this uh, is, is semi-familiar territory. Uh, but we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. And uh, let me again just remind you what we just heard in the video. Uh, our church turns one years old next week, so that's exciting. It doesn't quite feel like it because we've only been meeting in person uh, since about Easter, but uh, we started online like... Uh, Anna Marie just said at the end of August last year. Uh, if your Bible's open to Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read starting in verse 42 to the end of the chapter here. And just to uh, set a little bit of context, if you remember, if you were with us in the spring, uh, Paul, had, or sorry, Peter had just finished preaching this message and uh, in what we know as Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit fell on the people. If you heard about the flames of fire that were on people, then 3,000 people got saved at this, at this message. Right? How amazing would it be if there was a church gathering, if maybe it was at our outdoor baptism service or, or something, and, and there were 3,000 people that were standing around and ended up getting saved. That would be absolutely remarkable. And that's what we see happen here at the end of Acts chapter 2. So let me read immediately following that. We see in verse 41, 3,000 souls were saved. And then verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I get so excited reading that. I think that's uh, the desire of every church, right, for us to, to look like that, for the Lord to add to our number day by day of those who are being saved. Well, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for this gathering of believers, your church. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship freely without worry or concern of hiding from the government or anything like that. Lord, we can worship you freely, and so we praise you for that, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that in this moment we might hear from you May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you make the words in this book come alive to us? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as hopefully you know by now, if you've been coming back for the few weeks, or if you've actually been here at all, as you exit and you see all those signs out on the, on the path as you leave, 
our mission statement here at the chapel is that we want to see people believing in Jesus, belonging to family, becoming disciples, and building his kingdom, right? We know that as the four B's. Actually, let's say that together. That's the mission of our church. We want to see people believing in Jesus, belonging to family, becoming disciples, and building his kingdom. So th th that's how we here at, at the chapel, Nordonia, and all the other campuses of the chapel articulate the mission, the purpose of the church, which is the great commandment and the great commission to make disciples and to love God and love people. That, that, that's the mission of the universal church, but different local churches articulate that in different ways. And so we have the four B's. And there's nothing, you know, that makes our church better than any other churches because we have the four B's. All the churches, especially in the U.S., have different uh, mission statements, but uh, they're just ways that we can take the great commission and the great commandment and break it down into something that, that's memorable for us in the same way that many corporations, not that the church is a corporation, but have, have slogans, okay? And, and so I thought it would be uh, kind of fun this morning to, to throw up some recognizable slogans for major brands and see who can know what, what these are. So I'll start off easy. Uh, the first one, just do it. Just yell it out when you get it. Nike, right? We all know that one. Just do it. Uh, the next one, think outside the bun. Taco Bell. <laughs> Uh, the next one, I'm not going to make a joke there. Uh, the, the next one is Taste the Rainbow. Skittles, okay. All right, this is where, this is where it might get a little complicated, maybe not. Uh, what's in your wallet? Capital One, right? Kind of an invasive slogan, but. Um, okay, this one, the snack that smiles back. Goldfish, okay, I actually didn't know that one. We have so many goldfish in our house with Ada and stuff, and I, I didn't know that one. This one got me too. Think different. It's apple. Yeah. And then the last one, and uh, got milk. I, I didn't know either. I, I thought that was like the milk slogan or something, like just all milk. But no, it's actually uh, the real California milk company, so I, I didn't know that. As I was looking on the list, I saw some pretty terrible slogans. Uh, there was an airline, and uh, their slogan is good luck. <laughs> like, I would not want to get on that airline. And then there was one more. Uh, there was a sign in front of a BP that imagine more snacks than you can imagine. Like, that, just, that just hurts my head to, 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 think, of, to think through that. So, so why am I mentioning that? Well, the, the church, again, we're not a corporation. The church is not a brand, right? The, the gospel is not a brand. That's not why we're here. But just like uh, corporations come up with memorable slogans to hopefully tell you what they're about, that's what we do here through the four Bs. And, and so without lingering on this for, for too much longer, we talked about the first two Bs a couple weeks ago, what it means to believe in Jesus and belonging to family. Right? That's what we talked about, uh, that, that the church isn't just a, a social organization, but we're actually a family as the, the body of Christ, and that's why we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll talk more about that as we close next week. And then last week, I know it was confusing, we skipped to the fourth B and talked about building his kingdom. The only reason we did that is because uh, I actually wasn't supposed to be here last week, and so we had our missions pastor from uh, all the campuses of the chapel, Todd Schreiner, came and, and talked about uh, our missions partners overseas and, and what we're doing to, to build his kingdom. And then this week, we're going to look at the third B, which is becoming a disciple. Now, now right away, when we, when we talk about becoming a disciple, uh, that, that raises a lot of questions, right? If I was to ask you, uh, what is a disciple? If I was to bring people up and ask what a disciple is, we might get 10 different answers. Uh, because in our culture today, being a disciple is, is not a word that we use often. Right? We, we equate being a disciple to maybe the way that we might follow a, a celebrity or something on social media. But, but, but to be a disciple is not just to declare allegiance to someone or to be a fan of someone, but it's to be completely sold out and spurred into action out of the devotion for the person that we're following. I think the best definition of discipleship, as it's found in the Bible, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and here's what he says. He says, you are to imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so, so Paul is telling the church in Corinth to imitate him as he's imitating 
Christ. And so that's what he was talk, telling to the Corinthian church uh, 2,000 years ago. And that's our, his call to us as well whenever we read that letter. And that we're to model and shape our lives after the apostles, just like the apostles were modeling and shaping their lives after Christ. Now, does that mean we need to sell all of our belongings and, and move to the Middle East, you know, because that's where Paul and the other apostles were? Well, well, no, that's not what it means, but it means that we should follow their teachings and their devotion to those teachings and to the life of Jesus. So, see, the early church was all about pointing people to Jesus, both in uh, their actions and in their lives and in their teaching. Uh, the, the church w- was growing because people were completely sold out in their devotion to Jesus. And so this brings us to the first blank in the book on page 18. And that's that becoming a disciple is a process of becoming more like Jesus. That becoming a disciple is a process of becoming more like Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. And, and the next blank, uh, the biblical term for this, for becoming more like Jesus, is sanctification. That's a a big theological word that just means uh, becoming more and more molded into the likeness and the image of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever seen a chart that looks like this. There should be a chart on the next page. Uh, This this chart here, it shows the life of every believer. Everyone who puts their faith in Jesus. When when you become a, a Jesus follower, when I became a Jesus follower, I wasn't just made perfect on the spot, right? None of us are, are saved. We pray the prayer of salvation, and all of a sudden we're just perfect and completely sinless. We're made positionally perfect, but we're not just made sinless in the moment. In fact, Ephesians 2 tells us that before we put our faith in Jesus, we were dead. Okay, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Let me just read Ephesians 2, 2, or 2 1 and, and 2. It says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. So, see, that's the, the natural state. You know, we, we like to clean it up and say, oh, oh the world is, is lost, or, or we live in a dark world, and those are neat and tidy ways to say that what we're really trying to say is that outside of the church, people are spiritually dead and headed for destruction. But what happened? Well, Ephesians 2 verse 4, one of the best verses in the entire Bible, it says, but God. Like one time I want to do a sermon series or something on all the times it says, but God, because whenever you're reading in the Bible and you come across the phrase, but God, there's always something amazing that's going to happen. You know, it's a big deal. And so we were all dead in our sins But God, what did he do? Let's read the rest of it. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive in Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news, that we were all headed for destruction, that we were, were headed for hell, but God stepped in and made a way for us to be made right with God. And Ephesians tells us that when we put our faith in Jesus, then we're made alive in Christ. And when we're made alive in Christ, in the moment that we put our faith in Jesus, that's called justification. So I know I'm dropping some big theological words, but, but uh, you, you have justification at the moment you become a believer. And then what we're all seeking is glorification. Okay, glorification is when we, when we die and, and we enter into eternity and we're made uh, perfect and sinless. That's glorification. But in between is the process called sanctification. Right? Uh, glorification is not instantaneous. Again, we don't just pray a prayer and then all of a sudden just become completely sinless. No, it's, it's a process. It's a, a life. It says progressive growth. It's a life of, of sanctification. And it's during that time that we're being shaped and molded into Jesus' image and, and becoming more and more like him. Right? We don't, as the saying goes, we don't automatically become sinless, but we should sin less as we go through this process of sanctification. And one of the crucial aspects of sanctification is discipleship. It's essential. It's, it's, it's uh, what we see here in Acts chapter 2. And so uh, for the rest of our time, I want to kind of speed through uh, the, the discipleship section, the discipleship sex, section, it's hard for me to say, in the book. 
uh, and uh, we'll start in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, let me read it again, the first verse. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay, so, so they were devoted to the teaching of the word, they were devoted to, to fellowship, and they were devoted to breaking of bread and praying. And, and there's a debate whether that's talking about them actually eating meals together or if the breaking of bread uh, was, was communion when, when they met together. Now, now think about this for a second. Right? 3,000 people had just gotten saved. Okay? 3,000 people are brand new Christians. And, and yes, the, most of them, uh, it was in Israel, and so most of them would have known about what we call today the Old Testament. And most of them, well, they had to have known about Jesus because Acts tells us that it's only by putting their faith in Jesus that you can be saved. Right? So they, they knew a little bit about Jesus, but there would have been a lot of doctrine that they needed to learn. Now, these are 3,000 new baby believers. And, and what's interesting to me is, is that whenever... Uh, this passage is brought up, uh, it's all about the fellowship. And right? it's all about the fellowship of the, of the early church whenever we think about the end of Acts chapter 2. But, but what's the first characteristic we're given is that they devoted themselves to the, apostle, the, the apostles' teaching. And that's the very first thing we're told, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. See, there's many churches that are great at fellowship. Right, great at gathering together, great, great at eating together, even charity and providing uh, for each other, but they're lacking in doctrine. And I don't say that to try and make it seem like we're, we're any better of a church than any other church. But, but the word that's translated as doctrine here, it, it means uh, instruction, especially as it applies to lifestyle application. Okay? So, so in other words, uh, th this process of them listening to the apostles' teaching, it, it isn't just a head knowledge that they're receiving, but they're being spurred into action. And so even though the word doctrine isn't used here uh, in the verse, this is what it's talking about. This is, this is what they're receiving. And if we're going to be a healthy church, if we're going to uh, belong to a, a healthy family of disciples, then we need to be a church that keeps sound biblical teaching at the top of the list of our priorities. Uh, again, it's, it's early on in the book here. You can see all of our uh, church doctrine and, and what we believe as, as a church uh, collectively as, as all the chapel body of uh, the chapel family of churches. I love this quote here by a guy named uh, Tabidi Anawable. And he said this. He says, Preaching that points everyone and everything to Christ, insisting upon his lordship and our submission, our repentance and faith tends to separate wheat from chaff and makes the unconverted uncomfortable. So we, we want to be a church where we're, where we're welcoming and where those who haven't put their faith in Jesus feel comfortable being here, but we can't waver in our teaching. And eventually some of our teaching will make, as Thabiti says here, the unconverted uncomfortable. So I don't think it's insignificant that sound teaching is the first thing on the list here in Acts chapter 2. And it doesn't mean that we let everything else slide. It doesn't mean we only focus on sound teaching and, and don't have outreach and, and care for each other. No, we talked about that earlier on this summer, how important it is to hold both of those in balance, but it's important that we don't water down uh, God's word in order to try and reach the lost. So they cared about teaching, but they also cared about fellowship. Okay, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. This isn't a blank in the book, but uh, koinonia. It's used in the Bible uh, 20 times. It's like every a uh, hipster church on the West Coast is, on the West Coast is called like Koinonia Fellowship or something like that. But uh, it's a word that implies being in agreement with one another, uh, being united in purpose and serving alongside each other. In other words, and this is one of the blanks, they like spending time with each other. The church likes spending time with each other. And so as believers, we should enjoy spending time with other believers. And I know that it's difficult, it's easier said than done, because sometimes the church can be more divided than the rest of the world, it seems. But, but what's important for us to realize is that our fellowship, or uh, our koinonia with each other, is based on our koinonia, our fellowship with Jesus. We're going to come back to this next week, but uh, 1 John 1, verse 6 through 7 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, talking about Jesus, and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
So it's important for us to desire fellowship with each other, which leads to the blank on the top of page 19. Uh, intentional and regular meeting are important. Meeting, uh, intentional and regularly meeting are important. We read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so, so it says clearly here in Hebrews chapter 10 not to neglect meeting with each other. Uh, to quote D.L. Moody, uh, he said, uh, Church attendance is as vital to, disciple, to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. All right, so, so this right here, the, the weekly gathering of the body, it, it, it's important, not because not of the words that I'm speaking or the words that anyone else here is speaking, but because it's a chance for us to enter into actual real fellowship with each other. Uh, I think of it kind of like halftime in a game. If you're a sports fan and, uh, you know, each game, or m most sports, they, they have a halftime. Uh, not most, as soon as I said that, I started thinking of all these sports that don't have halftimes. But, but a lot of sports have halftimes. And, and right, what happens at halftime is that the team, they go into the locker room and, and they usually hear some maybe motivational speech and they, and they work on their playbook and see how they can adjust and, and talk about what, what, what went wrong in the first half and what they can do better in the next half. And that's kind of what this local gathering of believers is here today. We, we come into the church each week and we serve together and, and we worship together and the word is preached and, and we take communion, which in my view is actually the high point of the service on Sunday to reflect back on what Jesus did and then we leave and then we go back into the world. I love how we have the, the five minute countdown before service each, each week. Uh, it usually helps us start on time, not necessarily today, but, but uh, it, it lets us know when, when it's time to you know, sit down and, and get ready to sing together. I love the five minute countdown, but if we're not careful, then we can think that that five minute countdown is actually telling us when church starts. But no, the gathering of believers starts as soon as you pull into the parking lot here. And I'm thankful for the online streaming and, and the ability to, to record these services. But if we're not careful, again, we can start to think that the only reason we come here is to, to sing together and, and to hear teaching. But this isn't about a, a program, but it's about koinonia and the fellowship. And we can't really fully have that fellowship just online. I, again, I'm so thankful for the online streaming. that We wouldn't have launched our church last August if that wasn't available to us. But we have to realize that genuine community can't come when we're isolated apart from the rest of the body. And so let's be careful to make sure that we don't miss out on the importance of meeting together regularly in genuine fellowship when we're gathering together. A couple fill-ins here, and remember, uh, the, the Wednesday video will fill in the fill-ins that I don't mention here today. Uh, but spending time with believers is called fellowship. Spending time with unbelievers is called hospitality. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second, but um, hospitality, the, the word literally means uh, loving strangers, like intentionally loving strangers. And so I know we kind of use those words synonymously in English, but uh, there, there's a difference between those two words. Why should we meet regularly? Uh, it's commanded. It's how we grow. I think there should be a fill in on the next one here. Uh, it's commanded. It's how we grow. It keeps us from deception. Uh, we're not islands. We don't just live in complete isolation. It relieves burdens. It's helpful when we come to church and we realize that, that we might be struggling with something and then we meet someone else who's struggling with that same thing and, and the burden can be relieved that way. That's how we experience God. Right? I've mentioned in the past, our, our, our Christian walk isn't just only vertical, but it, it's also horizontal. Uh, and then it's also how we, are, how we are healed. So we don't have time to unpack all of those. Um, if, as you're still writing some of those down, uh, I also listed on the next slide some fellowship or koinonia opportunities that we have here. Um, these are in no particular order, but sports ministry is something that we've been doing uh, with softball. Uh, we just clinched a perfect season. We lost 17 games, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so we can use you next year. Um, serve, serving on Sunday mornings is, is important, and that's a way that we can actually fellowship. i got to say, actually, can you raise your hand if you were here uh, at, like early this morning, 7.30, if you were here. Just raise it up high. You guys are like so shy. A lot of them in the back corner right here. We had a lot of people here this morning. Let's, let's thank them. 
Uh, this was the fastest that we've been able to set up uh, since pre-COVID, and so it's largely because we had so many people show up. And, and even if you want to help with setup, that doesn't mean that you have to show up at 7.30, uh, but there's different uh, ways that you can help set up as well. Uh, but serve teams, uh, small groups. Again, it's important uh, if you want to be a part of a small group that you fill out that, that blue sheet, and we'll talk a little bit more about small groups and have the small group leaders available uh, next week. Uh, men's and women's ministry is something we want to continue as well. Uh, nursing home. Is that spelled right? Okay. <laughs> At least I caught it. <laughs> uh, but, but nursing home. Uh, and then uh, there, there's more ministries coming as well. So uh, th- those are all ways that we can, we can serve and, and, and have a genuine koinonia uh, here at the chapel in Nordonia. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, I mentioned this back during our Daniel series. And, and we're a new church, right? So we're still rolling out these ministries. I know it might seem like we're taking a long time, uh, but it takes a little longer to get things off the ground than it might at, at larger churches. So I mentioned this all the way back last fall. Uh, but when you came in, hopefully you also got a little square. And if you're watching online, there should be a square popping up on the screen here uh, pretty soon. Uh, but this is our discipleship pathway here at the Chapel Nordonia. So uh, I call it the one, two, threes of discipleship. So, so the square, uh, you can see on there, uh, 100, 100, 20, and 3. These are the different levels of discipleship that we have here at the Chapel Nordonia or that we're, we're aspiring towards having here at the Chapel Nordonia. Uh, the first one is 100. That, that's what's going on right here, right? We have, give or take, uh, about 100 people in the building on a, on a given Sunday, including everyone and the kids and, and everyone that's serving. And so there's about 100 of us, but, but discipleship can't just happen by coming to church on Sundays. And so the next level is, is 20, and that's the, the small groups and all the other ministries that were listed on the, the other slide there. Those, those are where we can enter into even closer fellowship with each other. And then three, and this isn't something that, that's regulated, but I think it's so important for us to be truly known by a few people. Right? To find people within the church that we can just lay it all out. And for, for men to find other men that they can just wrestle through sin with. And, and women to find other women for the same reason. And, and to speak life into each other, it's so important. That's something that can't be done in a, in a wider context. Right? And so uh, I'd encourage you to just hold on to that sheet. Maybe stick it in your Bible, that little square and be praying that the Lord will allow us to, to, to uh, flourish in these areas, right? In, in the large Sunday service, in, in our small groups and other ministry opportunities, and then that we can all just be committed uh, to, to really trying to disciple each other, even at a smaller level as well. All right, so uh, th- there's two more aspects of discipleship that we're going to talk about real quick, and they're not necessarily fun to talk about, but they're equally important. And the first one is church discipline on page 20, and then giving on the page that follows. And so church discipline isn't uh, seen in the passage in Acts that we read earlier, uh, but it's instituted in Matthew chapter 18. So actually, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 18. Uh, If you remember a couple weeks ago, I said that Jesus, uh, during his whole ministry here on earth, he only used the word church twice. And he only talked about the church two different occasions. The first uh, is, is earlier in Matthew when he talks about uh, the foundation of the church. Did I spell something else wrong? Okay. Uh, just don't tell me. <laughs> so ignore the misspellings. Um, but in Matthew chapter 18, or in, in Matthew, uh, earlier in Matthew, uh, Jesus tells Peter that his declaration that Jesus is the Christ is the foundation upon which the church will be built. And then uh, in Matthew chapter 18, he mentions the church as well. So I'm just going to read the whole section here. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. So verse 15 through verse 20. It says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, 
it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's interesting to me that this verse, in verse 20 here, it's always used in the context of talking about the church. Like people say, we don't have to go to the large gathering of the church because uh, as long as there's two or three of us, then Jesus is there, and, and that's the church. But, but this passage here is actually in the context of church discipline. Right? So we can't cherry-pick verses just to suit our own objectives and make the Bible say what we want it to say. This, this verse isn't trying to give us a, a minimum amount of Christians that you need in order to have a church service, but it's giving us a lesson on church discipline. And so what does Jesus say here? Well, he says there's four steps in the church discipline process. First, if you have a problem with someone, a, a brother or sister in Christ, you go to that person privately and tell them how they've sinned against you. And then if, hopefully, you're able to reconcile right there. Step two, if that person won't listen, then you go with another brother or sister in Christ, two or three more witnesses, to have that conversation again. And then step three, if they still refuse, then you bring them before the full church body and make the case against them. Now, now I know those of you who, who have the gift of, of empathy are probably shaking a little bit. You're like, why would you do that? Well, why would you expose someone's sin in front of the congregation? Well, well if that's not enough, look, look, there's one additional step, step four. If there's still no repentance, then the church is to, to excommunicate the person. Now, the word excommunicate is not in the text here, but that's what it means. Jesus says, uh, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, here's the deal. I think part of the reason that this is uncomfortable to us is that this passage has been twisted and misused. But look at the blank on page 20. The purpose of church discipline is not to punish an offense, but rather to restore to fellowship a believer and help them grow in Christ-likeness. So you see, this just struck me earlier this week. I've been reading this passage and, and, uh, for, for the last several weeks and preparing, and, and um, it, it struck me that Jesus told them to treat those who have been excommunicated like Gentiles and tax collectors. And how do we treat Gentiles and tax collectors? We show them hospitality. That hospitality is to love strangers. And so this isn't Jesus saying, hey, hey, kick them out of the church and don't ever talk to them again. But he's saying we need to love them, but we love them as someone who's outside of the church. It goes back to the difference between fellowship and hospitality. Because the church isn't just a social club that when people don't agree with us that we just, we just kick them out. But no, it's a hospital for the sick and, and the broken. And our mission, we talked about this last week, is to reach those who are lost and those who are hurting. And so church discipline isn't some archaic, outdated way to do church. But no, it's the way for the church to flourish and make sure that we're all walking in line with the way that God wants us to. So when a brother or sister strays away from the path, we lovingly walk through the steps of church discipline, not, not as a punishment, and not, a, not to try and embarrass them or shame them, but with the desire for restoration. So what brings uh, about church discipline? Uh, number one, uh, open, unrepentant sin. Uh, number two, doctrinal divisiveness. So, uh, again, the doctrine, our church doctrine is in the book here. This doesn't mean uh, that, that we have to agree on all the secondary issues, or even that you have to agree with every single thing, but it means that uh, you're not going to be openly divisive, and then just overall divisiveness, right? As a church, as a body of Christ, we're striving for unity. And again, divisiveness doesn't mean that you just disagree with me, or, or that we just have minor disagreements. This is talking about uh, real uh, divisiveness, uh, that, that's threatening to the church. So that's church discipline. And then lastly, uh, there's giving. I was kind of hoping we run out of time before I got here, but let's finish this off. Uh, if you don't have uh, the, your Bible still open to Acts, turn back to Acts chapter 2. And I'm just going to read to the end here. Verse 45, it says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their home, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Without working out every detail in this passage, we have to remember that, that not everything in the Bible is prescriptive. 
Right? A lot of the Bible, especially the narrative sections, are, are descriptive, and so they're describing what happened, not prescribing it to us. And, and so that's what's happening in these sections here in Acts. We're not told uh, that the 21st century church model needs to look exactly like the first century church model in every aspect. But what is both described and prescribed is that we should have hearts of generosity. And uh, so full transparency, giving in the church is one of the hardest things for me to talk about. And again, I think the reason, in, in a similar way that church discipline, the teaching is so misused, is that teachings on giving are often misused and abused. Now we've all seen the pastors, right, living in million dollar mansions and and profiting off of twisting these scriptures uh, while manipulating and, and taking from, from those who are, are giving generously above their means. And that's absolutely wicked. But look at what the blank on the top of page 22 says. It says, giving has more to do with your heart than your finances. Uh, the, the act of financial giving within the local church it's largely what allows us to have uh, the kind of equipment here that we have. And Lord willing, we won't always be a church that has to set up and tear down, but we'll be able to, to get a building and, and do more outreach and continue to expand our, our vocational ministry team, all with the goal of, of saturating Nordonia and the surrounding communities with the gospel. And, and that's largely uh, made, made possible through financial giving. So it's important for us to talk about this, but it's not about giving a certain financial amount. It's about the heart. It's not what we can get back. We don't give focusing on what we can get back. That's the first blank on the page as well. It's about the attitude of our heart. We're to give cheerfully, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians. And again, it's not about a certain number, but our giving to the church should reflect God's generosity to us. And it shows that we trust him and that we're thankful for what he's doing. And it's commanded in Scripture, right? So it's important. There's verses that are there in your book. Uh, that you can turn to and see as well. But again, again, it's not about what we can get back. It's about the positions of our hearts and our minds to focus on and trust God. But giving also goes so much more than just our finances. Right? And with this, we'll start to wind down here. Turn to page 26. Again, I know I'm flying through some of these blanks, but missing blanks will be in the Wednesday video at 6 p.m. Uh, but I want to make sure we get to this before we have our serve team fair right after service. But hopefully as you're, you're praying and thinking about how the Lord can use you uh, in this church and different ways that you can serve, uh, here's just, just some, some uh, things that you can keep in your mind. Number one, pray for God to reveal areas where you can serve the body. Right, so pray. Pray that God will show you where you can serve. Uh, be present with the body whenever possible. Uh, observe opportunities to meet needs around you. Take personal inventory of the ways that you can serve with your resources of time, talent, and treasure. And then ask church leaders how you can serve rather than waiting to be asked. And, I, and I'm thankful uh, that many of you have reached out with different ideas of how you can serve or, or how you can help out and know that uh, I'm keeping a list and, and, and working on getting back to you as well there. So, so those are the four B's. All right, so we talked about believing and belonging. We talked about building last week and then becoming a disciple. And we started this morning by talking about some of the uh, popular slogans and phrases that we hear over and over in our culture and trying to tie those to a brand. And I figured we'd close uh, by mentioning another aspect of our society that's seen over and over again in our culture. And it's not tied to uh, a specific brand or a phrase, but the ramifications are seen all throughout our culture. And that's that there's a growing number of people that are leaving the church. Right? God's still growing his church. And it's, it's disheartening and it, it's sad when we hear these stories about what's going on in Afghanistan and, and the persecution and, and people risking their lives to have a Bible on their phone. But the Lord is still growing the church in areas that are closed countries at rapid rates. At the early church, used to have a saying where they said, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So the, so the church will never fail from outside opposition, but from inside uh, the church, especially in the U.S., people are turning their back on the church at a rapid rate. 
Uh, this past week, I posted a video responding uh, to, to one of my favorite YouTubers, Christian YouTuber, uh, who declared that he's no longer a Christian, that he's deconstructed and deconverted from his faith. And as painful as it was to see that, now this is nothing new in church history, that people are turning from the faith and walking away and growing up within the church and then leaving. And, and we're just about out of time here, but uh, I saw a tweet from Pastor Eric Mason, who's a pastor and church planner in Philadelphia, and here's what he says. He says, a lot of young people who grew up in the church are going through a crisis. Deconstructing my faith, that, that phrase, is something that I hear a ton. Part of it is understandable. On the other hand, some of it is apostasy. And then he says this, the more unrecognizable the church is to the Bible, the more this will happen. Like, let me read that again. The more unrecognizable the church is to the Bible, the more this will happen. The, the more unlike the church uh, of Acts chapter 2 that our churches that we see in our culture look like, the more that this is going to continue to happen. And, and all people, young, old, are going to continue to walk away from the faith. But see, the early church, as it's described in the book of Acts, it's not an easy model for us to follow. But it isn't easy for us to elevate truth over the critics and increasingly anti-God culture that we live in. It isn't easy to prioritize Christian fellowship and, and personal faith and growth and, and reaching our neighbors. It is, it, is, it is not easy to prioritize that over our personal comfort and our own personal schedules. It's not easy to submit to what the Bible says about serving and, and giving and church discipline in, instead of trying to just do whatever makes us happy. And the early church wasn't perfect. If you were with us in the book of Acts study, you saw that they went through some major problems. But in their pursuit of holiness and unity and Christ-likeness, trying to be like Jesus, the church spread like wildfire. And in their desire to be more like Jesus, they spread the name of Jesus through Jerusalem and Judea and all the way to the ends of the world. And we're here today because they were trying to be like Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, discipleship is at the core of why we're here. We're not here to make a name for ourselves. Or we're here to spread the name of Jesus. We want to look more like Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We gather here on Sunday not because we're trying to make it a church building, not because we're trying to save up money to buy a church building, but because we want to look like Jesus and we want to spread the name of Jesus all over the community because we believe that Jesus is the only one who will ease people's, people's pain and bring people hope. And I think part of the reason that there's a mass exodus from the church is that somehow we've gotten discipleship all twisted or we've equated discipleship with how much we know or how much we do but it's not about just what we know or the, how many facts we know about the bible it's about our pursuit of becoming more like jesus and it's a journey it's about a sold out lifestyle and we can't do it on our own we can't do it in isolation Acts 2 says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. May the same be said of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you don't just leave us on our own to try and figure out how we can serve you. But Lord, you walk with us. And you, you're in the fire with us. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word, that you've given us the church so that we don't have to go through this journey of sanctification on our own. But Lord, we can do it together. And so, Lord, I pray that you will just stir something up inside of us that gives us a hunger and a longing be around those who are followers of you. But for anyone who is not a follower of you, anyone who's sitting here that, that knows that they're not a Christian or watching online and saying, I, I don't think I am a Christian. I, I haven't experienced that act of justification. I'm just trying to follow a list of rules. Lord, will you make yourself real to them? 
Lord, will you give them a, a hunger and a burning sensation that only you can fill? Lord, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.